that's terrific. Okay, Mr. John, we'll uh, kick it off here. I appreciate you having me. I really, I really love coming and speaking. And just as you mentioned, when the pandemic started in February 2020, that's when I started this. We had uh, ended Ham Nation after a 10 year run. <clears throat> and uh, uh, I, I used to go to club meetings. I mean, get on an airplane and go, but I, like, wait a minute, this pandemic started, I better not do that. And Zoom has just been miraculous as you have found out and so many other thousands. And uh, so that's that's how I got started doing all of these. Uh, this one is, th I think this one's number 330 that I've done since February. And I, I just enjoy them. I come back uh, as I have here several times on different subjects and whatever. So we'll get started here. I, I never know what to title these because it all gets crazy when I get to move it around. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to give you a couple, of, a couple of minutes of how I really got started. I, when I was uh, 12 years old, my parents bought me a B3 Hammond organ. We're talking many, many thousands, and they were not rich people. But they thought I needed that because I had been playing the accordion. Well, uh, I, that was in, in 1952. In 1954, I got a job in a, a restaurant here in the area. I was only 14 and I was uh, playing on the weekends, making more money than my teachers. And so I really got into it. The following year, I was picked by Stan Can at the Great Fox Theater in St. Louis to be his substitute and a four manual Wurlitzer. And uh, th this was a big, big move for me because the reason he, he had picked me is that I, I was young and he could teach me things. I didn't have a, my ways set, but that organ hadn't been played in 20 years. And in all these pipes, that's just a few hundred, there are 3,500 pipes from one inch to 32 foot in that organ. And we had to voice and tune those, get it all back to, to where we needed it to be. And of course, I also played uh, uh, shows uh, in between the movies. So it was wonderful. But what does this all have to do with ham radio? It's where I learned to listen. A lot of people don't listen. They just hear. Listening. It, it, it it's very important because hearing is a physical process. We all hear, but listening is a mental process where you really have to dive in and see what's happening. Well, that same year that I became the organist at the Fox, uh, later on that year, I became a ham radio operator. One of my high school friends had gotten a license. And so I thought that'd be fun. And so went over to Walter Ash and then bought a, my parents bought me a, a Harvey Wells TBS 50D and SX99 and a VHF converter. And it was uh, the beginning of a miraculous time in my life. That particular Harvey Wells, you can only see the top of it, dang it. It's, uh, it's right there, but I use it a lot. I'm on the air every morning. What you see on that screen uh, is all my AM stuff with exception of the 20A. And I built that when I was 18 years old. And uh, it just works so good. I've got the 600L amplifier. And uh, what I use mostly is up in the upper corner, uh, the little VFO sitting on top of an ICO 720 and the 730 modulator. And I pair that with a Mosley CM1 receiver. And I have all other kinds of things that I move around with, but that that's my mainstay of AM these days. But it was, it was very rewarding to me to be able to tune and voice all those pipes. The Fox also, a few years later, called me, they were, throwing out their sound system. I said, really, well, what's the deal? 
Well, the deal was that the sound system that was in there was built in 1932 and they were Western Electric uh, 16 foot folded horns, big Olson bins, Harry Olson, if you know the name Harry Olson. He was a great, uh, a great engineer uh, for, uh, for them. And um, you probably know Harry Olson better if I showed you this. He was the guy that designed, invented, whatever, the big ribbon mic from RCA that for years was the mainstay of recording and uh, any kind of live sound. And uh, this one is just beautiful and it still works good and all that. But Harry Olson did a lot of things and that one was one of the main things he did that uh, brought him to prominence. But um, I started playing with that and uh, I had some Macintosh amplifiers and I figured that's, you know, I've heard about a Macintosh. So I bought a, I bought a bunch of Macintoshes and away we went. And I was building all kinds of systems and stuff around all of that. And um, one of my first, uh, first jobs, I guess you could call it, <laughs> uh, major jobs uh, happened to be Jimi Hendrix. This was oh. quite something in that I was not really in tune with uh, rock and roll at that time. I was the theater organist, so I listened to. But uh, word got out that this guy in Marissa, Illinois, a little coal town in southern Illinois, of only a couple of thousand people, had this sound system that I was running around with. Well, it really caught on quickly. That first show was amazing. Jimi Hendrix experience. Janis Joplin opened and it really opened my eyes and my ears to what they needed. And before we knew it, Ohio Sound was becoming one of the major sound reinforcement companies in America. And then we started doing things in your country. I, uh, I got a call one day from the Who, <laughs> and they needed my sound system. And so, okay, here we are. And uh, I was with them for six years, lived in England, lived at the Marble Arch Hotel for four of those years. And it was quite something. Pete called me one day, and we had finished a leg of the tour, and he said, hey, Heil, come over, I want to talk to you. So I come over. I love to come to your country all the time. He said, I got an idea. You know, this is 1973. Quad sound is a big deal right now. And uh, you think you could make the PA so that we could move Roger Daltrey's voice around an arena? Well, no is not in my vocabulary. <laughs> and so we did. And uh, what you're seeing there is a wonderful mixer that we built in England, just about that time, it's so interesting that it was all put together at the right time. IES, Inter International Entertainment Systems, they were a sister company of ours. And they would, if they, they did the Emerson Lake and some of those large bands, they didn't have to bring all their big speakers to America, they could use ours. If we brought uh, well, if we were doing Humble Pie or, uh, or, or the Who or any of that over there, we'd use there. So we just had to move the mixers around. But we had to build the mixer. Bill Hoff was the engineer at IES, and he and I put our heads together, and we came up with that first and uh, only quadraphonic si uh, system. And uh, we built uh, four of those. Uh, one of them still resides in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which we're very, very honored to be to put into the Rock Hall. Uh, there you'll see a picture of it behind me after many years on the road. Uh, the big white speaker behind is one of the monitors. We were the first sound company 
back in 69, 1970, to do monitors. Because what happens when you put a monitor real close to your microphone? <laughs> Everyone knows what happens. It feeds back. So what are you going to do about that? And it all started with me with the Grateful Dead. Uh, right after the Jimi Hendrix experience, the dead, uh, the long story there, but uh, I, they came to St. Louis and they didn't have a sound system uh, because their sound system had been confiscated by the DEA and the FBI. I wonder why, <laughs> because their truck was full of dope. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the uh, DEI and the uh, DEA and the FBI took the truck and Owsley, their sound man, away after a show, the first show on their tour in New Orleans. So the band came on to St. Louis because they didn't have cell phones. They didn't know anything wasn't normal. They get to the Fox Theater. Just amazing how all these things in my life do this. They came to the Fox Theater. Where's our gear? They call back to San Rafael. Uh, wait a minute. Um, they're in jail. Really? So the Fox stagehand called me and he said, hey, talk to this guy. And this guy was Jerry Garcia. And it started a lifetime friendship. I really hate it when he passed away because we were, we were doing all kinds of things. One of them was the monitors. They were using two microphones. One of them was wired out of phase from the other one. So it didn't come through the monitors and the monitors didn't come through the main. And so I said, to, P, uh, to uh, uh, Jerry, I said, Jerry, you know, we could do that a little easier. And of course, phasing is one of my, just my beloved subjects. I could be here for hours talking about phasing because it affects everything in amateur radio and audio and just about everything else. And so what I did is I did the amplifier and the speakers for the monitors out of phase from the mains. And we could do it with one microphone. We took that microphone feed into another mixer that was out of phase. Well, it started a big deal and Heil Sound was, we were the first ones to do all that. But uh, some of our uh, monitors were, were just incredibly crazy, especially with the Who. I mean, uh, half the stage was filled up with monitors. But the situation was that we had a lot of contact with Humble Pie, Jay Giles, and Kansas, and this is to couple on them. But the deal there was that Humble Pie came to America and their manager hired me because of the, all of the, uh, uh, it was the promo that everybody had made about Heil Sound. We, we were the sound company. And uh, they pulled one of their guitarists out, Peter Frampton. He was only like 18. And Peter became a solo artist. And did the, his first one was uh, Frampton's Camel, and it really wasn't a very good band. Why do I say that? <laughs> because Peter stopped the tour right in the middle. He said, "This is bad. This is crazy." He wasn't happy, and so he took off a couple of years. Well, there was a little girlfriend of his that was living in my hometown of Marissa, Illinois. She actually had hooked up with the tour manager of, uh, of the Who. Uh, I mean, of uh, I'm all right, of a humble pie, Mick Brigden, and they were living uh, in Little Marissa. A lot, we had a lot of uh, road crew and stuff that would do that because we had a seven thousand square plant and thirty five people, and we could build things for them. Tell me what you wanted, and the next day it was done. And so we got a lot of uh, a lot of play from these guys. Well, one day I get a call from Penny. I hadn't seen her in a long time. 
She was actually married in our home. We had a big old Victorian home there in Marissa because she was, she was going to marry Mick Brigden, which she did, but they needed a place to do it. So we did it in our home. I had the Hammond organ and I played for them and I had a minister that was uh, kind of crazy. He had a tie-dye, tie-dyed robe. <laughs> it was something. We're talking 1973 now. And she said, listen, I'm with Peter Frampton now and, and uh, I need a Christmas present. Really? Okay. Don't send him any guitars. I got, he's got a lot of them. So what did I send her? Of course I did. I had been working with Joe Walsh, two hams, we found out after we were on the tour with the James Gang. And uh, he had recorded Rocky Mountain Way in a studio in Nashville. And this studio was uh, Pete Drake's great guitar player, steel guitar player. And he had this little three inch speaker and a funnel and a little hose. Fine for recording because it was real low level and he recorded with it. We fast forward that a couple of years, we're putting Barnstorm, his uh, solo band together in our plant in Marissa. We, uh, we were the, uh, the first uh, uh, companies that brought the Mellotron to America. I was a Mellotron dealer, the only one for several years. And uh, we had a build a case for it and all that. And uh, Joe used that and a lot of other people. But um, he said, what are we going to do about this talk box thing? And I didn't quite know what he was talking about. And then he explained it. I said, well, all we need is a big driver. We can't use some little three-inch speaker. So, a mm -hmm, couple hundred-watt driver and away we go. <laughs> We built this little guy, formed this thing to fit the tube into the diaphragm. Rock and roll, big time, loud dog box. And uh, Joe is the first one to use that. But here's Penny wanting a Christmas present for Peter. Yeah, I sent him one of those. <laughs> he will tell you today, it really launched his career in the solo world. <laughs> because he uh, he he was such a kind, great person. We got together and we really appreciated each other's talents. But um, you'll see in that bottom picture, we we're building hundreds of talk boxes after he hit the big time with his uh, uh, Frampton Comes Alive album. That was a huge thing. And four of the tracks were centered around the talk box. But um, I got, I got kind of tired of all of the stuff that was coming and that was punk rock stuff. And I'm going, I don't think I want to get involved in this one. And um, Frampton was off the road. Walsh was off the road. Who? Uh, there was a time around 1980 that, Rock music was just, wasn't gone, but it's diluted and, and I didn't need all this. And about that time, I got a call from Paul Klipsch. Paul was the father of the hi-fi movement. He was the father of the folded horn. He was an amazing guy. And he called me, he said, that you, Heil? And I said, yes, who's this? This is Clips here. And I'm going, whoa, this is God on the phone. What can I do for you? He said, I want to come and see that 6,000 watt PA. And so he flew his little airplane up. He had a, a Bonanza, flew that little baby up to Marissa. My life changed. All day long, he's asking me questions. Well, why did you do that? Well, how come you did that? What school did you go? I didn't go to school. Well, you didn't You didn't go to college? No, I barely made it out of high school. Barely. I, I passed, but it was all kind of red Fs. <laughs> but no, I didn't have time for all that. I was making lots of money. I knew what I was going to do. I didn't need all that. <laughs> Maybe I should have, but I didn't. And so... 
he's asking, well, where did you learn this? Uh, ham radio. No, I mean, like, yeah, it's okay. Where, where did you learn this? Who taught you this? Uh, amateur radio. Hi, you don't understand. I said, no, you don't understand. I learned it all from ham radio. From the very first week, I was building things. And it was one of those situations that a lot of people would ask me. We'd go into these big arenas in um, your country, my country, and, and we were doing all these new things, big stuff. And they hadn't really heard or seen anything. My, like, where'd you learn that ham radio? I got that question all the time. You mean you didn't go to college? On it? No, I didn't go to college. So, hmm, bingo, it all started. Well, he put me in his plane. We flew back down to Hope, Arkansas. His home, uh, home. The next, uh, the next uh, day was the beginning of several days of unbelievable uh, consequences. Uh, we see a picture here of his his lab. That was an old telephone exchange building that had been vacated, and he that was his lab where he was developing things. What you see on the left, he's in front of one of his K horns, made it out of plexiglass, so you could see all of the intricate angles that it took to make that thing. And then a picture of he and I at the top, and uh, his K horn was every, everything about phasing and. Uh, and directing the audio where you needed. If you've never experienced, notice I didn't say here, if you've never experienced a Klipsch K-horn, whoa. What he did, as you can kind of see in that picture, it was made in an, in an angle, 90 degree. And you put it in the corner of your room. And you had to have eight foot of wall this way an eight foot of wall this way. So when you put that in the corner and they would bolt it into the studs of that, that corner, your room became the last of the 32 foot of the speaker. Your room was part of the speaker. That's why I said, you don't listen, you experience. It's the most incredible speaker you will ever wanna hear. But uh, he was, the next few days, he was just teaching me all kinds of stuff. And then he said, Hi, I'm going to guide you to the studies of Bell Labs. I think this might do you good. Okay, what are we talking about? Well, it was the fact that the early telephone systems did not work. They put two wires from New Jersey out to California. And when they got to the other end, Hmm. Of course, they put in a very nice flat response. You, you know, we got to be flat. Well, no, you don't. Only certain things. But when you got to the other end, ho, 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 it was terrible. This is what the first telephone system from the Bell Labs sounded like. All I did was remove one frequency, but it's all mushy and bassy, and it, it, it doesn't sound very good. Bass is not what you want to do. That only eats up your RF power in the amateur radio world. So let me get this back. I'm only turning one control. What is that one control? Hmm? It's a parametric equalizer. And that was the gain for the 2.5 filter. Here's how we learned that. They had they had to do something with the with the telephone system. They just absolutely had. And so they put 4,000 scientists, all of them, at Bell Labs on this project. Because they had to do something. I mean, this was a big deal. What would we do without a telephone in those days? And so they put their two best guys, Dr. Harvey Fletcher and Dr. Weldon Munson. I would only hope that you guys and gals know about these guys. They were the lead scientists for the 4,000. What they came up with? 
It wasn't anything like this. It was the way our ears worked. And this is what they came up with. It changed drastically with level. You look up at the top, it's almost flat. But as you get down here, that's 100, 110 dB. That's why kids like to listen to music loud. Really? And so, what down here where you're listening today, 10 or 20 dB of level? Look what happens to your ears. Look like a ride at Disneyland. And what these guys all came up with was this. And if you don't take anything away from today, take this. What you see is a 3K wide signal, which is what the telephone system basically was. Uh, that also is like something you talk into every day, 3K wide, huh? Yeah. Well, you can't possibly do that because when you do, you heard what happened. You've got to have that 2.5 elevated. And I'll do this again. I'm going to take out that 2.5, which is rich in gold in there and where it is here. I take it out. Now what you got? It's not very articulate. The difference of an F and a, and a P, an S and an F, uh, it's hard to understand those things. And so what we have to do is come up with some means of putting it back in. And there we go. You can hear the second it hits, 2.5K. I didn't touch the bass. I didn't touch the treble, nothing. Just 2.5K is all I'm playing with. And I want you to realize how important that is to the human ear hearing system but now that they discovered that what, what are they going to do because there were no equalizers they had to come up with something so they did it with of course a high pass filter I, i'd also show you a low pass filter which means nothing here it with a resistor and a capacitor the right ones you can roll off the low end that's what the resistor does to ground. It comes through the capacitor, depending on the size of that capacitor, how wide a response you'll have, and then you're going to knock out some of the base. And while we're on the subject, you want to do a, a low pass, it's just a reverse. All the base comes in through that resistor, and the treble goes to ground. Well, that is exactly how things happened in the telephone system. And it remained constant for all those years. You see, there was, there was no equalization. We were void from 1920 to 1967. There were no boxes, dials, or whatever. It was void of serious equalization. Yeah, we could do it with uh, resistors and capacitors, but we needed more. Well, in 1967, and uh, right in the middle of when I was out with the Who and Humble Pie and with all those great bands, and um, I had heard about Langevin. Langevin was a company that built mixing boards for recording studios and broadcast stations. And I had heard that they came out with an equalizer. And I thought, whoa, I, be I better go check this out. So I told, I, I go to Mountain View, California. I walk in and the first thing I saw, you know, we, we in those days, <laughs> this is what I mixed Jimi Hendrix with, that green one on the bottom. That's what I mix Walsh with. That's what I mix a lot of those bands in those days. That's all we had. Just little line 
Mike preamps, bingo. Well, I knew there was something better around the corner. So what do we do? I walk in the door <laughs> of Langevin. And the first thing I saw was this. And I'm going, whoa. They broke the ceiling on mixing consoles. It wasn't rotary. It's really difficult to mix with a rotary knob because you you got four or five of them. You don't quite know where they are. You can't see them. Of course, you can't turn them all wide open. Well, there are some people that does that to their ham radios. <laughs> all knobs to the left or right or whatever. <laughs> well, I said, man, we got to talk about this. And they said, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We're going to take you around the corner of something that's about six months from being produced, and you probably will want it. Check this out. Now, you got to understand, at this time, nobody had any kind of equalization. Nobody. I uh, was guided around the corner and this is what i saw oh my gracious you can't believe i was so impressed i'm going wow a graphic equalizer my oh my oh my hmm so i bought a bunch of stuff we got it all back to marissa in the next few months we, i had a a local carpenter built me this case and out of some uh, nice wood. We had two of those mixers, 16 channels, and uh, there was a compressor limiter they had. On, but way over there on the <laughs> in the background, it got a bright light from the camera on it. That is the equalizer. Well, you can imagine Heil Sound rolling into an arena with this instead of those little line mixers because that's what everybody was using so we did really jump ahead a lot but i'd been off the off the air for 12 years and um i, I just kind of when this punk rock came in a few years later i'm going hmm, i don't know if i want to do this anymore because they were not nice people and uh, they didn't want to use our equipment. They're going to tell us what to use. And no, we're good enough for the Who and Humble Pie and Walsh and the Grateful Dead. But you, this isn't good enough for you. No, no, no. We got to. OK, tell you what. See you later. And I retired from that business after about 13, 14 years. Sold the whole system. Yep, that included. And it, it was one of those things that. I felt good about because it was a new new page. So I get back to ham radio. Mm -hmm. What happened to my Art Collins audio? What happened to my great audio? Huh? Gosh, it was all real narrow, and I had no articulation. And I'm going, what happened? Well, we know what happened. There was no equalization. And so I thought it was time for me to do something about it. And I did. 1980, I was on 40 meters a lot, almost every night. And I had a group of guys, four or five of us. And I was building an equalizer. And the whole world came after me and people, this pile ups of people that were listening to all this going on. Well, what is that? Well, what that was, was this. It was the first equalizer ever in ham radio, the EQ 200. The filters are at 160 Hertz. All you could change was plus or minus. Couldn't change the frequency. We didn't want to. I already had figured that out. What was the other one? <laughs> you know what it was. The other one was the high. At where? 2.5K. Yes. Look at that. 2.5K. Crank that baby wide open <laughs> to start. You might want to feather it out. Well, anyway, I, I wrote an article 
about this project. And um, I sent it to the ARRL and one of their editors called me back and he said, this is a revelation. We've been, uh, been trying to figure out if there was anything like it and there never has been. And so we're gonna publish that article. It will be the lead article and it will receive the cover award. And of course, I was very, very humbled and impressed that they did this because equalization is so important, so important. And I was, I was thrilled. Well, in 1999, I got a letter from Dr. Inouye, Inouye Communications, mm -hmm. ICOM. He had a picture of his station. It was a, one of the great IC781s and he had one of my equalizers and he had one of my gold line mics on one of our booms. We were the first company to bring booms to this industry. Why? Because I am always soldering or doing something. I can't have them. I, I want I, I <laughs> And so I brought booms to this industry and now tens of thousands later, yes, the broadcasters, the podcasters, I can't believe how many of these, I mean, we ship out thousands of these things a week of the booms because it's the only one that has a topless boom on it. What happens here is you pick the top off of this and I want to the cable goes inside. You don't have to wire tie it or any of that. And so the cable is taken care of. That's one of the big the big pluses of the Heil boom. But anyway, we were we were really having fun with ICOM. He said, I'm thinking of new radio. And from the Pro 1, Pro 2, Pro 3, all the way out to the great 7300, 7610, 7851, and that wonderful little 705. They all have my equalizer in them, a little two-band equalizer. Yesu came to me a couple of years later and said, we want to do this better. I said, well, we'll do it with a parametric. Yeah, that'd be good. Uh, not so fast. Why? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because you don't have two controls that I've already set for you. You have nine and you don't know where any of them are. You have to figure them out. And so the majority of Yesu owners are still in the default mode. And when I hear these guys on the air, I just cringe because they're wasting the most important product they have in their radio, the equalizer. So we had to work on that and get a website that was really quite nice. And here's what you do. First of all, when you set down at a radio, what's the first thing you do? The very first, you decide what you're going to do. You're going to do right you. You're going to do contest. You're going to do net control. You got to figure that out. Why? because you need to set the bandwidth. Look down in that third piece there. TBW, transmit bandwidth. There I have it on wide, which is 100 to 2900. You can set it for whatever you wanted, but for rag chew, that's what we're gonna do. You roll off a little bit of the base, as you heard, we can't put up with that, and plus that 2.5, that treble. And now, you have a great sounding transmitter. We're going to get into setting the mic gain here in just a minute. They also, ICOM also asked me to build them the right microphone. See, none of these companies build their own microphones. It just destroys me. It's like, are you guys kidding me? Oh, it came in a box. I also got the Ken Wu name on it. Well, they didn't build it. <laughs> they didn't build it. I had some OEM company in China or wherever build it. It wasn't a product that they really researched and did. So ICOM knew that and he had me 
design, the ICM. It almost spells like I won't work on the ASU, won't work on Kenwood, won't work on Ellicraft, won't work on LTCO or nothing else, just ICOM. And boy, does it work. Oh, oh. You just watch your uh, ALC meter and set it. We're going to get into that, though. But the ASU, that's a whole different ball game. You have down at the bottom, there, there are nine, filt fine, nine controls, and you have to figure out where you want them. This is a broadcast piece. In fact, you can see it over there, that blue panel right there. I never go on the air on AM without the proper setting and you're looking at it. The first one I roll off the base to uh, uh, somewhere underneath a hundred and the bandwidth, that's a bandwidth of the audio. Uh, usually an octave, octave and a half is where I set it. Not a big deal where it is, but then what do you do with the leather one? You cut it. I notched it by about what, uh, 10 dB. What's the next filter? 2.5K, absolutely. Same thing of the uh, octave, octave and a half or so. And look at that, plus eight. And then for AM, I needed the top 6K. And uh, we increase that a little bit. But what do we do with the ASU? It's very simple. I was very disgusted. When they first came out, I told Dr. Hasegawa, education is going to be a problem. No, it ain't going to be a problem. I, yes, it will. Well, it is. It was and it is. Why? Because you don't know where any of these nine go. And so they have graphs. Ah. And they look like this. I designed it for them and I can't understand them. It's just a bunch of bobbly goo. What is this? No, what they should have done is what we do on our website. This is what you need to do. First of all, here is a picture of the Yesu. They're all the same. Everything from the 9,000 out to the 101, they're identical. You just have to set the same levels. The first one, I set it at 200. I notch it 3 dB, two octaves of bandwidth. Don't worry about that too much. Just set it there. The second one's at 900. There's a real weird thing that happens in all audio. It's a real honky sound around 600 to 1,000 cycles. And so uh, that gets rid of some of that. And again, a lot of people don't, don't realize that. But here's a great demo for you. Do this to your ears as you talk and you'll hear this real hollow boxy sound as you're moving your hands. Try that and you'll see what I mean. We wanna get rid of that. Well, that all happens at about 900. So we're gonna notch at three or four dB, two octaves of bandwidth. What are you gonna do with the third one? Of course, you know, 2.5 plus eight. And we put that all in a very simple chart you go into our website, there's probably uh, probably 30, 40 pages or more uh, of how, under DSP settings for the different rigs. But you'll see this. And that's just exactly what I told you about here. Now, one, one of the things they did, you'll notice in the bottom, it's repeated in red. If you turn the compressor on, you have to re-equalize it because the compressor does not use the top filter uh, uh, levels it uses the bottom but i got a message for you listen up do not use compression Hiles huh. crazy he told us not to use compression you darn right i did all it does is distort your signal it takes a lot of the presence of the audio out it does not make you louder what's going to make you louder mm -hmm. i just I've just been telling you the whole time. It's the right equalization, the right microphone, and how to use it. We're going to get into that real quick here. But it just really boggles my mind. Kenwood was, look at this. 
they came to me and I, I designed a little six band graphic. That's what they wanted a graphic. Okay. Well, they called me and said, well, we're going to do our own here. 13 bands. Are you kidding me? 13 bands and 3K? Like what kind of an idiot engineer did this? And then this is what they have in their book. I took this from their book. Look at that. They raise up all the base. The 2.5 just kind of lackluster. And then they take down some of the treble. Like, what is wrong with you people? You're engineers. This is what it should be. Roll off some bass. Keep that 2.5 in the middle. And roll off a little bit of the top end. And if all that doesn't work, why? Huh? What? No matter what you have. This is an incredible outboard EQ. It's by Sergi. I'm sure you might know about this guy. He's got a rough time right now, but he's making it. UR6QW. Yes, he builds these in your crane, and he's still making them. Thank you, Sergi. This is quite a piece. And... Uh, so a lot of guys, even though they have equalization in their uh, in their radios, they just as soon do that. And it's really, really something. I love Sergi's uh, products. He's got a couple of others that are really great. But there again, you must keep in mind, you have to listen. Listen to your signal in another radio. So important. And also, never, ever keep your RF gain wide open. You want to re reduce that RF gain, and you never want to see anything that's going to cause noise to come in more. And, and a lot of people say, well, if I don't have the gain wide open, I can't hear the wikis. I got news for you. Yes, you can. What it does is it takes the noise floor down, but the signal's still there. And you just try it sometime. You never see any of my radios with the RF gain wide open. It's usually half to three quarters, depends on how strong the signal is. It's wonderful. You need to pay attention to that. And uh, the other thing that I think is is very important is everybody needs an oscilloscope. You can buy them at a ham fest for 40, 50 bucks, huh? Well, you, hey, hey, smart brains, hi, um, hey, there's no coax connector there, idiot. How do I, how do I plug that into my SO239? Well, no, you don't. You have to build this. Oh, you mean I have to get out of soldering? <laughs> yes, you do. It's very simple. Get you a little metal box. If you don't know where to get it, and I'm sure you have places there, but in America, wow, Antique Electric Supply. They are amazing. they have That's where I get a lot of the parts and things to keep all of this stuff going. Antique Electric Supply. Two, co two coax connectors in each end of the little box. I used RGA. You just need a big, strong, heavy 12, 16 gauge wire through there. And then on the input side, you do a voltage divider of 51K and 680 to ground. And at that junction is a 0.04. That's what you plug into your scope. And you will be able to see what your signal is doing. I talked a lot about microphone, how you use it. It gets very disgusting for me to hear guys on the air and they're in their easy chair and they get back about this far and, uh, well, hi, you're stupid. All you got to do is uh, just to go over here and uh, turn up the gain. Well, then it looks, sounds like I'm in a roller rink. <laughs> it's like, what's wrong with you? Uh, I don't read this 
in the manuals. See, this should be the second question in all of these license manuals. I firmly believe that. There are several things that should come about. I was fortunate. And when I met with Paul Klipsch, he gave me a gift. He gave me this, the Audio Cyclopedia. It's 1,750 pages of anything you want to know. One of the things is about the microphone. You never want to be more than two inches from it, ever. And if you happen to have a, a, a voice that expresses a lot of air, because some voices do, then you get a lot of peep pops. And the only way to do that, and we supply this with all of our microphones, is a acoustically transparent. A lot of these are out there, but they're dollar, dollar and a half pieces of crap because they, they're not acoustic. When you put this on, it muffles it up. Well, it shouldn't, as you just heard. And a lot of times, hey, Joe, take that stupid muff off. And when he takes it off, it's a whole new world. Well, he's using, maybe he uses one of his socks. I don't know. But if you use the right acoustically transparent, you got it. And we uh, we have these for all of our microphones. And it really works because what it does is it gets rid of the plosives. And uh, the other thing is you don't speak directly into the microphone. You pay attention sometime to broadcasters. A lot of broadcasters do not speak right straight because of the pops and all that. They speak across it, and you can do that easily. And then the distance of the microphone. I want you to understand this is another thing you must take with you today. When you double the distance, you lose six decibel. Now think about that. You double your power, that's 3 dB. You're going to toss six of it out because you're one of these guys that want to be five or six or eight, 10 inches more. You cannot do that. Well, you can, but you sure did lose all of your transient response, your dynamic range, and a really nice, sweet audio that was into the microphone, but you took it away. Please, I listen to guys on, I'm on the air every day. I listen to a lot of guys and it's like, oh man, are you kidding me? And so we, we pay attention to that. The other thing about our microphones, Paul Rogers, yes, of Bad Company, as well as Joe Walsh. Ask me to build him a microphone. Paul says, I got an audio mixer out there. He doesn't know what he's doing. Build me a microphone that's very articulate and he doesn't have to equalize. Well, you're listening to it. I, I This thing is flat. I turned it off a while ago. I can do that. And I can, yeah, come on here. I can take it down to nothing, but I'm going to take it back just flat and you can you can hear the difference. And so, what you have to do hmm, is get the right microphone, which Paul asked me to build. He also asked me something else. He doesn't want to be stuck right here. And this is something that almost all of the entertainers use. And it's what I call their ego microphone. What are you talking about? Well, they all got one. They've had it for 70 years. Yes, this is 70 years old, the, the, the design, and it hadn't changed. But watch this screen and listen to what happens. You see everybody with these right here. You know why? Because if they move off, look what happens. Listen, it's gone. Hello? 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 And so what we have to do is devise a microphone that doesn't do that. 
and it's all of our microphones. Listen how much richer it sounds, first of all, because of the articulation I built into the capsule. And watch this. I can move off. I can be all over my face, and it's still there. That's what Joe, that's what all wanted in the first place. And now so many entertainers, they got next to that. Wow. And it certainly is a wonderful thing when you have microphones that'll work for you. The other one. Is the great PR 40. Oh, I gotta watch it. This thing gets really wild. <laughs> uh, the great PR 40. It's the only, only dynamic microphone at any price that will get 28 cycles out to 18k it also is one of these it's 180 degrees on the front think about that we don't have to do this no and so this has been a real real boom to so many artists it's a great instrument microphone and i do have a lot of artists use it for vocals but here's the biggie Remember I told you about phasing? Well, I applied a really cool phasing thing in this one. Joe wanted a mic that he didn't hear all this stuff behind him. Watch the screen. This microphone is 40 decibel down. 40. You ready? Here it is. Oh, it still works. But it's 40 dB down. No other microphone will do this. You can check me out on it. Trust me, because I've already done it <laughs> years back when I started developing this thing. It's amazing. And all of our microphones are pretty much like that. But uh, learning how to use that microphone is very important. You don't want to be more than two inches. And uh, sometimes talk off the side if it's one that will allow you. You can't do that with these things. You can't do that with your stock microphone. <laughs> so these are just things that I, I'd love to bring to your, to your knowledge. Well, um, there's just so much more to get into. But let me get into a little bit of situation with uh, antennas uh, antennas they're so important and it it's all about phasing and i i i got involved with the yagi antenna and how it was designed you see dr yagi didn't have any kind of equipment he had a field strength meter he put that field strength meter out in front so far, left it there, had a boom, had a driven element that was resonant, uh, 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 resonant. There is no antenna to be used unless it's resonant. I don't want to hear a bunch of darn tuners and coils. I want it resonant right from the start. Then you have things that work well. Well, that's exactly what he did here. A resonant driven dipole and he had a, a a little transmitter and out out in front was a field circuit meter and he had all kinds of aluminum he cut them different lengths and then he went by wavelengths fourth third half so on and when he got to that third in some cases it really increased the signal and no batteries needed same situation he did behind he did it longer and if he hit the right spot it was going to be out of phase which means aha it cancels oh what do you mean what do you mean it cancels well it's very simple and i get really disgusted because i don't hear enough about it and it affects everything you do in amateur radio and what we're talking about is how does you get how do you get that 
that driven element and the reflector, you get those out of phase in the right, the right uh, dimensions and it will cancel. Well, here's what Dr. Inouye did. Uh, this is a great d demonstration that you're going to be able to use a lot. Here we go. Okay, I have a Y chord, and this Y chord, not playing any games, but this Y chord allows me to have two microphones, and I don't have to play games, and I'm not doing anything crazy. Both are PR-22s, good old Paul Rogers wanted me to do, and they sound exactly like they're in phase. Now, what happens if you take two signals in phase? Mm -hmm. Of course, it will double by 3 dB. Really? See if you can hear 3 dB. A lot of people, I got a 500 watt transmitter and I'm not making it, so I'm going to get me a kilowatt. You're only going to get 3 dB. I don't care what you say or what your buddies tell you, you get 3 decibel. Here comes 3 dB. Watch and listen. See if you can hear it comes up by 3 dB. I can see it on my meter. Here we go. One, two, three. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> you really want to know about this thing and understand it? Close your eyes. Listen. Remember what I said about listening. I'm going to take away 3 dB, which could have been thousands of dollars if you had an amplifier so here we go one two three the human being cannot detect 3 db only in an, an echo chamber or some recording studio that's made to be perfect in their acoustics but that isn't why i did this i did this because I'm going to add this little guy. What is this little guy? This little guy is a plug. Right, come on here. This little guy is a plug that's wired backwards. Pin three is to two, two is to three. Well, big deal, Heil. It sounds just like the other one. Yeah, I know it does. I didn't say it's going to sound different. But it's out of phase. This one that's in phase, when you speak in it, the diaphragm goes down. This one that's out of phase, the diaphragm comes up. You have two signals out of phase. Watch and listen to what happens with two signals out of phase. Nothing, nothing, they cancel. They cancel. Now, how many hours do we have? <laughs> it's my favorite subject. I'll come back sometime and we'll get into a lot of phase again. Simple one. Some idiot piles on your frequency. You're talking to your buddies. And you hit your notch filter. He's gone. How's that happen? It takes that offending signal out of phase. Goodbye. See you later. Bye. So good. How did Yagi get his antenna to work? Because he was able to get things in phase in the front and out of phase in the back. I love phased arrays. And this is an amazing, amazing thing to do. This is a 75 meter one. I have two telephone poles that I got from a, an exchange, telephone exchange company. And it was really cool because uh, uh, I had a lot of acreage, so that worked. But for 40 meters, you only need 33 feet. And they're separated by 64 foot, and they're 64 foot high. You bring all the down leads. The down lead is 126 foot. Couple them together with T connectors, but then that red, that. 
is 43 foot of phasing line. The remote switch, this was 500 feet from the station here. When I switch it to the left, that's the driven element. What happens? It goes through also 43 foot and it puts it out of phase for the rear. So you can get rid of nonsense from the rear. Switch it the other way, it goes the other direction. And here's what they look like. Here, I hope you can see this. And the bottom is, uh, I have the on the top, but the bottom is a 40 meter phased array. I went 33 foot up the pole, ran a messenger line, you know, a good heavy five inch stack run rope and 33 foot apart out there, I mounted those two 40 meter dipoles. So you see, it only has to be 33 high and 33 wide. Everybody's got that much. It really plays big time. You can do it with verticals just as well. You have to do the radials and all that kind of stuff. But it's just such wonderful things that we can do with phased arrays. And last but not least on this subject, <laughs> I told you, but let me change this. have to carry those old guys around. What happens here? Hmm. It's a good old resonant dipole. There is no other antenna. There is no other antenna that will outperform it. A resonant dipole. Yes, it's for a single band. The other thing you can do, and don't get carried away, but you could add a couple of coils, which would work well on 40 meters can do that kind of a thing. You also could do a fan dipole, but no matter what you do, they're going to be resonant. And here is what Art Collins, the great Art Collins said about dipoles and the height. The optimum height for a dipole has been a subject of much conjecture and really good arguments on the airwaves. Oh, do I know that? A publication from Art Collins stated, now get this, write it down. Most transmitting antennas of resonant dimensions elevated at a quarter wave above ground are as close to 100% efficiency as possible. Hmm. What's that mean? Well, it means when you put up a dipole, you know where the resonant or uh, where the uh, uh, direct ray is, but there's another ray. There's a reflected ray, and you want that. Well, if you don't pay attention to it, you're losing it, and you can really increase your signal by getting them both together. And you do that by the height above ground. I did a wonderful study back when I first got into uh, into my uh, extra class license. I was a technician for 17 years with six meters open all the time. And um, what happens here, I had these guys at California, Florida, guy in New Orleans, a guy at the Collins uh, station in Cedar Rapids, and a guy in Ohio. I would start out the night with a with a resonant antenna at 20 feet on 40 meters. Okay, cool. And every night, I would come on with a different antenna at different heights. Wow, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Took a lot of work, but I, I I took time to do this. The first night, we did one at 20 foot, so we know where we are. But then I raised it up to 40 feet. Now you, you think doubling's gonna get something. It wasn't, didn't do much at all. Oh, well, I gotta go higher. I went up to 50 the next night. Now I understand when we first come on the air, we see what the atmosphere is doing with that resonant one at 20. Then do it. The next night I came on with it at where? 33 
feet. Yes, a quarter wave. And it was much stronger than 50, even 60 feet. I came out another night. I had a 70-foot tower. I put it up, the dipole up at 66 feet. Oh, man, it's like turning on an amplifier. You see, we're using these wavelengths because we're, we're putting both of these waves together, the reflected ray and the direct ray. Why are we not? And I, why do we not hear more about that? It just bugs me. But that's, that's just some of the things that really... Uh, <laughs> They really uh, are not good because if they're not talked to us or taught to us, then what do you do about it? This is something that I know a lot of you might have to do. Attic antennas. Here's a guy in Kansas City that did a miraculous thing. He took a ballon, put it on a piece of plexiglass, a fiberglass it was. And on the bottom right, you see, put two strips of aluminum and he drilled all the holes and put wing nuts in each one of them for the wires to connect to. This is what it looks like in the attic. And you see how he's got all these wires. Here's a picture of all the wires strung out and they were cut to resonance 80, 40, 20, so on. Here's another picture of how he did it. Now, I wanted to really check it because there's a lot of doom and gloomers. Oh, that won't work. Okay, let me show you this one. Now, he knew six meters was going to be outrageous, but he didn't care. He only needed it for a repeater. But every other band, look at 40 meters. All of them. He cut those to center resonance. He's worked over a hundred countries with not very much power. And wow, it really works, really works. And I was really happy to learn about that because it, it really means something. Last but not least, I'm gonna to talk to you about coax connectors. You know, you get the handbooks and they show you how you gotta solder through the little holes and all of that, and okay. Can you 1,000% bet on the fact that they're not all soldered? Are they all are soldered? No, you can't, because I'll tell you what, you can't. There's no way you're gonna solder all of those little leads, because if you get it really hot, you melt all this center insulation. Well, I did that. I was on the air for two weeks. And I made up a couple of cables and they were not really pretty looking. But one of my mentors was a CBS engineer at KMOX 50KW radio station in St. Louis. And I met up with him on six meters. And I went to visit him one time because he was on single sideband. He was one of the very first on single sideband on six meters that he had built the rig. And I showed him this. He's coax. And he said, what did you do there, kid? I said, well, that's the way the handbook. He said, no, that's not the way you do it. I said, well, all the handbooks tell you that. I don't care what they tell you. I'm telling you, it ain't right. Okay. So here's what you do. This is very simple. This is what you do. First of all, you cut the center insulator if you're going to use, uh, I don't know you put the adapter on it, but you do that center insulator and you put it in the center. Then you take a pair of scissors, almost what I do, and I cut off about three eighths of an inch of the shield all the way around it. Now, before any of this happens, I forgot to tell you, put that in a vise and solder all around it. It's going to be horribly hot. You won't be able to hold it. So put it in a vise. You want to make sure it's 100 degree around. 100% of all that's there for you, okay? And then you can guarantee 
every one of the little shield wires are soldered. For years, I would tape them up and look like that. Simple stuff, right? I know they're all soldered. But the problem is my friends in these early days, they're making fun of me. <laughs> what are you doing? And uh, I'd, I'd show them one that, that I had uh, had done. And uh, that's not how you do it. I said, well, uh, uh, who says, well, this is the handbook. Well, the handbook's wrong. So I would take the words from the engineer until fast forward that several decades, just around 2015 or so, I visited Tim Duffy. You know Tim Duffy, K3LR. He is the contest mogul, owns some of uh, DX Engineering. He's an incredible guy. You ever have t any kind of questions about an antenna? Get a hold of him at DX Engineering. He'll be thrilled to help you. I go into his station. Here we are, 11 multi-kilowatt stations. He built all the amplifiers. They all had 7851s. Beautiful. All the computers and stuff. I mean, he's the leading contest station. I look over in the corner, and there's a whole bundle of coaxes coming in. Wow. And I go over and look at one. And what did I see? They were all done like this. I'm going, oh, my gosh. I go over. And I give him a big hug. Oh, what's wrong with you, kid? I said, you just made this thing right for me. And what are you talking about? And I told him the story. He said, oh, no, you can't do it through the little holes. You have to do it like that. <laughs> and so I was vindicated. <laughs> It was so much fun to learn that things were right. <laughs> it was crazy. Wait, how do you get coax into your room? I do it with a toilet flange. I put it down on the subflooring. Then I put the tile down. Bingo. There's 15 coaxes coming out of both of the places. And it works really great. Just a thought for you. Well, we need to come back sometime and talk about the pine board. That was an incredible thing. Still is. We got a lot of people building this uh, five watt AM, 160, 75, and 40 meter band switching transmitter. I use it a lot. And it's just so cool. We got great uh, diagrams and stuff for it. But uh, there again, it's something that we don't have a whole lot of time today. If you don't have a copy of our Heil hand reading book, you want to check with some of your dealers there. They have them. And uh, if they don't, you can order it on our website. And those that's ordered on my website, I'll autograph it to you. But it's got lots of stuff, stuff you don't read in the manuals. And last but not least, I think I showed you all ago, we're the only manufacturer in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame all kinds of things. That's the quad mixer and the monitors, power amplifier. We built modular power amplifiers. So if you had trouble out on the road, you pick out a spare module and plug it in. The other picture has got ZZ Tops mixer, one of the first monitors, got the first talk box signed by both uh, Peter and Joe and other things we did. And I was recently given a honorary PhD at Missouri University. It's just, remember, I'm a kid that just barely made it through high school. And so it was, it was something when they did that. I was so humbled, very, very gratifying and blessed. But they're just, as I said, there's so much, but I hope that some of this will help you. If not, send me an email and I will try to answer them. We'll Get on Zoom if we have to or whatever. I'm here for you all the time. And uh, I just remember, uh, I, I'm still at it, designing things, helping you, doing these things. Sometimes I do two or three of these a day, depending on, like, I've got one. I'm coming up at 7 o'clock tonight uh, in Ohio, I think it is. And then I'll do one at uh, 10 o'clock our time. 
uh, in California. So I just love sharing this hobby. It's just something that means so much to me. You have any questions that you want to bounce on me real quick? You can do that. Well, thanks, Bob. I was going to, to ask if there were any questions. I can't see all of your faces. So uh, if Emily and Jonathan can help me, any, any questions? Um, Jonathan here, I've got a question. Um, yeah. I couldn't, I, Bob, I couldn't see a link on your website um, to order that handbook. Are you on the ham radio page? Uh, the, the best place to do it is uh, all one word, heilhamradio.com. And it should be there. Thank you very much. Great stuff. Uh, any other there. questions, folks? Just pile in if you want to ask a question. So I, I can I have another one, John. Um, yeah, go ahead. Bob, do you do CW as well as voice? I do not. I just, I, I know I should. I did in the very beginning and mm -hmm. uh, had to learn it to get my extra class, but I'm always doing something. I got, I got to have my hands free. And uh, yeah. I absolutely admire the CW guys. They can be in a contact on CW. They can be talking to you in the room and they can be listening to their wife all at the same time <laughs> and doing this at 60 words a minute. God bless you. I, I, I saw an example of that the other day. I was um, visiting a, a blind uh, gentleman who's in our club, actually, helping him with a problem that he was having. And... Um, he, he was demonstrating using the, uh, the, the beacon network. And um, there was just this faintly audible twittering sound. And he said, oh, that's the Azores beacon. And you know, it's just amazing. I, I, I couldn't actually hear it was Morse, but um, he got it. It's incredible. Incidentally, he also said, have a little go on this guitar. So I had a little go on this guitar. I'm not very good at guitar. And uh, I said, that's really nice. He said, yeah. He said, uh, I'm glad you like it. It's insured for £26,000. It was given to me by Eric Clapton when he was sitting in that seat where you are now. And I thought, that's pretty cool. Right? Have you met Eric Clapton? I did. Yeah, we did some did some uh, some shows with him. And kind of interesting, we did one uh, tour that Bobby Pridden, the, the sound engineer for The Who, uh, he, uh, Eric tapped him to be his audio engineer on those tours so of course bobby came to me and uh we used my pa and bobby mixed and i was there so and that was great that was cool, cool. thank you yeah thank you bob thank you so much for a, a wonderful uh, talk as always it's been absolutely fascinating and and enthralling and we're very grateful for your time i know it's you said yourself you've got three today and we're yep. just blessed that you were able to uh, help us and support us out once again. And it's really great. And thank you so much for, for your talk. Well, thank you. I appreciate being here and come back and really dive into those antenna projects. <laughs> yeah. And the, uh, and the pine board sounds really interesting. Yeah. Interesting. special. That's it up over my shoulder. That one. It all started with this one. A friend of mine who was a retired broadcast engineer gets on our AM net in the morning. And uh, the first Monday of each morning, we have a thing called the peanut whistle net. We are we're only able to run five to 10 watts, period, uh, for half an hour. And uh, he comes on with stuff that he built on pine board in five watts or so, this little guy. Mm. Going, wow. That's uh, that's pretty interesting. So I went to visit him. He's about 150 miles away. <laughs> I went to visit him because I, I, I was just mesmerized when he built all this uh, and it worked so well. <laughs> and so there again, uh, we, uh, we, we do things because we're hams. There's a guy that built it. It's a quarter watt, maybe a watt 
with a 12 AX7 on 75 meters and he built an antenna tuner for it. And these are some of the things that we get into big time. And I'm, I'm very, very happy that, uh, that it's taken off and it really has taken off. All the parts are available from Antique Electric Supply. So you don't have to worry about that. That was a big deal. I got flamed really bad when I started this back in 18 on Ham Nation. Oh, you can't get the parts. Well, yes, you can. You just got to know where to go. <laughs> and I bet you guys and gals have places in England you can do that. That was that first one I just showed you that. That was the first. And then after a, a year or so, we we added another part of the coil and band switching and, and all that kind of stuff. And we build them in cigar boxes. And one guy built one of them in his kid's uh, lunch box and just crazy stuff. But we're hams. We love to have fun and we make things happen. And that's all you can, all you can bet. Thanks very much. Let's come back and do it again. And, uh, Yes, thanks, Bob. Where we go from there. Bob, before you before you go, it's Andy M zero I R U. Yeah, good to see you again. Um, I've got one quick question for you. Now I know that you referred to Sergey's um, uh, uniform Romeo Six Quebec whiskey. His um, his uh, mixers with regards to audio. Um, have have you never thought of making one yourself? putting one oh. to market oh we built thousands of them oh yeah oh, but i i did them for local bands and yet there's a lot of tours went out with a couple of them it was right. very unique it was modular my power amps were right. modular and when you right. bought the mixer or the power amp we gave you an anvil case with a spare modules, a screwdriver, <laughs> really a screwdriver because they were Phillips and, and a module for the mixer. And that you could go out in about five minutes if your amp had died, pull out the module, plug in the other one, you're back on the air. And we built right. a lot of those. You look up a Heil HM1000 and we, right. built, we built an HM1600, an HM2500. Yeah, we did. We did a lot of them. Yeah. Right. Okay. But what I'm referring to is um, the, you know, the uh, mixer that Sergey makes for the Icoms or the Yesus, the equalizers. Yeah. Yeah. Is Hull not bringing anything to market to, to uh, or are you just leaving that alone? Well, when I did this in 1982, yeah, uh, we sold thousands of the EQ two hundreds. Yeah, yeah. but lot. what I'm saying is, are you not gonna are you not gonna reproduce them? No, for and the new was, for the new amateurs. Okay. Well, the reason is that there there are so many good ones. Sergi's is incredible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Julius Jones has a great one, and yeah. I just I didn't, I didn't want to compete with the guys because they had their own little niche, and I thought. Yeah. Hey, you know, go ahead and do that. I'm happy with yeah. what we're doing. And yeah. I, I know a lot of people go, oh, I'll just stomp on them and do it. No, no, that's not me. I, I wanted to share with them. And uh, Julius was the first one that came out with him. And it was great. And I still mm -hmm. have a couple of them around here. And Sergi's mm -hmm. is wonderful. So yeah, that's why I haven't just... done that. I didn't think I didn't think I could add any more than what they've done, honestly. Right. Okay. Yeah, no, that's that's a fair point. Okay, next question. Hey, you thought you were going home. Um I've got the I you know, I've got the ICM for the seventy six ten. Yeah. What would be the benefits of me um hitting the buy now on a PR forty? What what would I benefit? It's going to be hard to tame, but the PR40 will give you a, a much bigger, richer sound. The only thing is, the yeah. 7610 doesn't have a real live front end. The, the mic preamp is a little lame. Most uh -huh. of the ICOMs are. <clears throat> and yeah. So sometimes you just, you just don't get enough mic gain because it's uh -huh. a dynamic. Doctor, yeah. in a way, was looking for an active 
electric microphone. And, and so <clears throat> his preamps aren't, they're, they're not as, uh, as vibrant as like Yesu or Ken would. I, yeah. if I were you, I would save that money. I would uh -huh. take that money that you're going to spend, give it to your wife and let her buy some shoes and purses. What do you think? No, <laughs> I'm sure I'll find some, I'm sure I'll find something else to spend it on, Bob. <laughs> My wife already has enough handbags and shoes. Don't worry about that. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> Okay, Emily, folks, is there anyone else with any questions or we'll em draw it to a close? Emily might disagree with you, right? <laughs> I might yes. tell you one, Andy, that you said that. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, eh? <laughs> okay, Bob, well, once again, many thanks for everything. It's been a great evening for us or afternoon for you. I'm very, very grateful and hopefully hear you again very soon. You take yeah. care now. Do this again and uh, pick out some other things that we can talk about. There's Cheers. Thank you. <laughs> and yeah. uh, it, it, now, um,